Thank you for joining us. A Hebrew word for learning and remembrance is zachol. In Jewish tradition, the command to remember is absolute. But its obligation does not end with the cognitive act of memory. It must be connected to both meaning and action to pass the torch of memory on to the next generation. I'm Maya Peretz, and our program today is about the little known story of 16,000 Jews from Nazi Germany who escaped the Holocaust by going to Shanghai. To tell us about Jewish survival and life in Shanghai is the noted historian and author, Professor Steve Hochstadt of Illinois College. China is one of the most fascinating tourist attractions in the world. The Great Wall of China, built more than 2,000 years ago to protect China from northern invaders, draws millions of visitors every year, in addition to the many other unique destinations. These include the cities of Kaifeng, Harbin and Shanghai, where Jewish communities thrived for over seven centuries. China offered a safe haven for many thousands of Jewish people who fled from the persecution in Russia in the beginning of the 20th century and from Nazi Germany. More than 16,000 Jewish people moved to Shanghai and thereby survived World War II. Most of them left after the war, but many still remain in China. Visitors can see the Jewish Museum the ghetto and the synagogues and important buildings in Shanghai. In Beijing, there's a new Jewish community center, including a museum and synagogue. China is not only an endlessly captivating land with a continuous civilization of 5,000 years, along with modern day extraordinary achievements, but China shares an important part in Jewish history as well. With us now is Professor Steve Hochstadt of Illinois College. It's a pleasure and honor to have you on the show. Hi, Richard. I'm happy to be here. Well, you've written books and you have done so very much in your career to further education, whether it is history, whether it is Jewish education. Tell us a little bit about what you do, sir. I teach history at a small college in Illinois. Uh, that history has become, over my lifetime, much more about Jewish history. Uh, I'm a European historian, originally a German historian, but I've come to focus a lot on teaching the Holocaust and uh, that's a very uh, rewarding thing to do in Illinois, especially students, high school students in Illinois learn about the Holocaust uh, in high school. Uh, it's it's a, a state law and then they come to my class so they have some knowledge and most important, they think they want more knowledge. And so they come to my class with a little bit of hunger for learning more about the Holocaust. I also teach about the Russian Revolution and European history. My students don't come with a hunger to learn more of that. They take the class because they think they should, uh, because it, it fits their major. But in the Holocaust class, they feel like they ought to know more. And that makes a huge difference in the interaction that I can have with these students. So. Uh, I've become, over my lifetime, I've been teaching for 33 years, I've become a Holocaust historian, which is not where I expected to be when I started. Steve, that's most interesting. And, you know, referring again to your books, I have to ask you, how is it, as an historian studying German history, how is it that a country of such famed literature, science, art, poetry, classical music, was a country in which such evil was tolerated and permitted. Uh, my thought on that actually uh, is, 
what is the value of eminent science and so forth if it's not accompanied by a sense of social and moral responsibility? What are your thoughts on this? I wish I could answer your question with some sort of certainty. My students, in, uh, when I teach the Holocaust, also want to know, why did this happen? Uh, they don't know as much about Germany, but they want to know, why did people, why did, would any people do this? I don't have a definitive answer. Uh, in Germany, some of the most educated people, highly educated people, were the greatest killers. I can't explain that. Uh, the ideas they had about Jews, about us, about what we're like, about what we think, about what kinds of morals we have, were so far from any reality that uh, it's really hard to understand how they got these ideas or how they could believe them. Many of these Germans knew Jews, and they knew, therefore, that th those Jews were not at all like the picture that they had of Jews, but they still had that picture. And then when it came to killing Jews, that picture was much more important than the real Jews that they had met and known. Really inconceivable, difficult to comprehend, and of course justify. Tell us more about your books. Uh, you actually wrote one book in German and one in English. Tell our audience about that. I'm especially interested in Jews who escaped the Nazis and went to Shanghai. And that brings in my family. This was something that my grandparents did. They left Vienna in 1939 and went to Shanghai and spent the war in Shanghai. And like about 16,000 other Jews from Germany and Austria were saved that way, avoided the Holocaust. And no one knows about the Jews in China. Well, I think uh, there are a few books about it, but I'm trying to let more people know about this because I think it's so interesting. One of those interesting things to me is to watch individual people realize that they have to leave, that they have no place to go but Shanghai because it was the only city in the world where you could go without any permission, without any visas, without any papers. So if you couldn't get to the United States, as my grandparents couldn't do, you couldn't get a visa, couldn't go to England, you could go to Shanghai. Watch those people get ready for the trip, make the trip, and then live in this very strange, exotic, but difficult new city that they're not used to, surrounded by people who they don't understand, uh, and make a new life. And that's, uh, when I say watch people, the way I work is to talk to people, just like what you're doing here. I get, uh, I've gotten a hundred Jews who went to Shanghai to sit with me and a tape recorder and to tell me their stories. And uh, mostly I don't ask questions, I just let them tell me what they think are important. And then uh, this book and a book like this in German, uh, what I did was to take a dozen of the most interesting interviews, edit them so that they're readable and put them together so that you can follow this dozen people as they realize they have to leave, as they pack and buy tickets, as they take boats to Shanghai, when they're there, what they do, and then finally they come to the United States. These are all people who ended up in the United States. And I follow their life that way. And I think uh, what I'm trying to do is communicate to a reader, this is what it was like for these people. This is what it would have been like for you if you had done this. Where can people obtain this book? This book can be gotten uh, on Amazon. It can also be gotten from the publisher, Palgrave Macmillan. Uh, I wish I could say it'll be in a lot of bookstores, but I don't know that that's the case yet. Just like people in the world don't really know about the story of Jews who escaped to China and found sanctuary there, thanks to the Chinese government. On the other hand, during that terrible time in history, Jews tried to escape to other parts of the world. In fact, a ship, the St. Louis, came to the shores of the United States just to be turned back and sent back to, the, to their death, basically. Tell us about that. That's exactly why people went to Shanghai. None of the people that I talked to, including my grandparents, really wanted to go to Shanghai. But it was so difficult to get into the United States or any other country like Cuba, that ship, 
the people on that ship thought maybe they would be able to land in Cuba, but they couldn't land in Cuba. They weren't allowed to land in Florida, and they got sent back to Europe where most of them were killed. An atrocity. In fact, I would say that the lack of cooperation and humanity on the part of the Allies in effect is tantamount to collusion. If the United States and Great Britain and other countries had been willing to take more Jews in, more Jews would have been saved. They couldn't have taken in the six million Jews who were killed, but they could have taken in another 100,000 or 200,000. They certainly could have saved more people. Another thing that's not known to the public is that there were many decent Germans who objected to what Hitler was doing and were killed for that, and some Nazi officers went to the Vatican. There's a, there's a book by the author Rolf Hochut called The Deputy, a play, in which uh, this fact is illustrated. Well, one of the things that I see in talking to these Jews who escaped was that almost all of them tell a story about a Christian family who helped them in some way, perhaps hid them, on Kristallnacht, uh, perhaps helped them get tickets, warned them that uh, the Gestapo was going to come to arrest them, or offered some help. And then, even more interesting than that, I think, there were Germans in Shanghai, that is, German Christians in Shanghai. There were uh, thousands of Germans in Shanghai who were doing business. Those were Germans, just like the Germans in Germany, but in Shanghai, they did not try to kill or even harm Jews. They made friends with these Jewish refugees. They did business with them. Uh, they even saw them socially. What mattered was this craziness in Germany and Austria. And once you got outside of it, you weren't so crazy anymore. On that note, I'd like us to pause for these commercial messages. We'll be right back. We're back with Professor Steve Hochstadt. Steve, I'd like to ask you, what actually was special about life for Jews in Shanghai as compared to being a refugee in another part of the world, if you were lucky enough at that time? Well, I can compare the experiences of my father, who came to the United States at age 18 from Vienna, and his parents, who had to go to Shanghai. When my father came to the United States, he became an American almost immediately. He began to speak English. He uh, got a job, and he stopped being a refugee, and he became an American. By 1942, he was in the U.S. Army, and by 1944, he was back in Europe fighting against the Germans. The refugees who went to Shanghai could not become Chinese. It was much too difficult. They didn't understand Chinese language. They didn't know Chinese customs. They wouldn't have been accepted by the Chinese. They stayed together as a group of refugees. And during the war in Shanghai, these 16,000, they created, recreated culture that they were familiar with, which was a German Jewish culture. I think the best example of that is that these Jewish refugees created a school for their children called the Shanghai Jewish Youth Association School. It was staffed by refugees. The woman who was the director had been a Jewish school teacher in Berlin, and all the students were refugees. The only difference between a German Jewish school in Germany and this German Jewish school in Shanghai was that the language was English, because that was the common language in Shanghai. But it's very interesting to see these Jews recreate their culture. They created plays. They wrote operas. They put on performances, which they were familiar with, in the German language or in Yiddish. And so it's, you can't see that in New York or Los Angeles or other places where refugees came because they became Americans. And here in Shanghai, you can watch them recreate their culture at least for a few years. Well, this is all extremely interesting. And uh, I very much appreciate your being here to share this with our audience. Another thought is, today in China, there's a great interest on the part of the Chinese with regard to Jewish culture. There is the, the uh, Department of Judaic Studies at Nanjing University, for example. I had the pleasure of meeting Professor Xu Xin, the head of that department. Tell us a little bit about the fascination 
the Chinese have with Jewish life and why. This is something that I discovered without intending to, uh, going to China to try to do research about these Jews in Shanghai. I discovered that there were a number of Chinese, Shushin is one of the earliest, who were interested in the same stories, who were interested in the history of Jews in China, not just these Jews in Shanghai, but Jews in other cities, the Jews who came to Kaifeng in the Middle Ages. As I've been doing this research over the last 25 years, I've seen also an, a flowering of Jewish studies in China. Nanjing is a center, so is Shanghai, so is Kaifeng, uh, and I've gotten to know both older people who are our age, Shushin is our age, who have been interested in this for decades, younger people who are doing now their PhD work or even undergraduate work studying Jews. The Chinese are very interested in our history in China, and they have become interested in our history in the rest of the world. They want to know about Israel. They want to know about the Holocaust. They want to know about the Talmud, which you don't expect when you go to China. And I've, uh, this has been very interesting to me, to meet these people and to ask them. My most recent trip to China was this summer. And my main goal was to find out, why are you interested in Jews? What is it? And I came across, I think, the most interesting answer from some scholars that I met at a conference in Shanghai, a Jewish studies conference that I was privileged to attend. I was the only Westerner sitting in a room full of Chinese scholars. They were mostly presenting papers in Chinese, which I didn't understand, but I could uh, talk to them and see what they were doing. The Chinese, especially scholars, think that we Jews have some knowledge that they could use to become more prosperous, wiser, and they want to know what that is. They want to know how have we survived for so long in such a hostile world? How have we done so well? What are our secrets? I'm not sure we really have secrets, but the Chinese scholars certainly believe that studying our history is a way to understand those things, our success, but also to understand Western history. If you want to understand the history of the West, which has been the dominant power in the world, you need to understand our history, the history of Jews. This is what they believe. And so they are creating these Jewish studies programs, which exist now at five or six different universities. They are training scholars in uh, Jewish studies, they are sending scholars to Israel to study, and they're giving people like me a chance to interact with them and help them in that process. This is really fascinating, and I'd like to ask you, how does your professional life, your, your teaching school, teaching history, what is the relationship between that and your personal life, actually? I'm the son of people who fled from the Nazis, and uh, the grandson of people who went to Shanghai. When I grew up, there were little uh, Buddhas on shelves in my house. Uh, like most kids, I just took my family for granted. I thought every child all across the United States had Buddhas in their house. Uh, after a while, of course, I discovered th that that wasn't true. And it's taken me a long time. It took me almost into my 40s before I realized that my grandparents' experiences going to Shanghai and then coming to the United States, that that was worth studying, that was worth some professional work from me. Uh, and I've, I interviewed my grandmother, she was the first person I interviewed, and that set me off on this path of interviewing a hundred other refugees. I keep finding connections and uh, paths into the bigger story of the refugees from the little story of my grandparents. And uh, so I'll, I'll just give you an example. Here's a copy of a document that I got from the Library of Congress. It's a Japanese document which lists refugees by name and address 
who did not have to go into the ghetto that the Japanese set up in 1943 for all these refugees. These are people who got out. And I always knew my grandparents did not go into the ghetto. My grandparents told me that. And here's my grandfather's name on this document as someone who, one of maybe a hundred Jews who did not have to go into the ghetto and his address. Now this leads me further. I want to know who are these other people on this list? Were they doctors like my grandfather and that was why he was able to stay out? The Japanese wanted to keep Jewish doctors in other parts of Shanghai because they thought that was valuable. Were these other people doctors? This is something I can get my students involved in. This is something that I can eventually write about. And it's something that touches me personally. Almost everything I do now in my professional life also touches me personally. And I find that very satisfying. The importance of education. One of my best friends is Dr. Abraham Fischler, the president emeritus of Nova Southeastern University. In fact, he met with Professor Xu Xin uh, of China when he visited Florida. And I'd like you just to share with our audience how you see the importance of education. Why do we need to teach in general on these matters and other? Here, I have the same ideas as Chinese scholars like Professor Xu Xin that I think the Holocaust, terrible as it is, is important to teach, and not to teach because it's terrible, but to teach because when students confront it, they learn something about themselves. And uh, I think, especially comparing teaching the Holocaust to teaching other European subjects that I teach, what I see in students is that they think that when they learn about the Holocaust, it means something to them. They ought to do something now. They don't know what to do, and if they ask me, I don't have good answers. What should you do? But some of them feel, we want to create peace in the world. We want to prevent genocide in the world. We want to make the world a better place because we've learned how awful it was in the 1930s and 40s. And that's a very rewarding thing for me to see students take some knowledge, book knowledge, and want to apply it to their lives. Speaking of education, technology has made many changes in our world and uh, generally it can be used in a positive way or negative way in entertainment and television also. So much nonsense is broadcast out there along with wonderful programs on Science Channel and Discovery and other but I'd like to ask you, in your world of education, things have changed a lot also. People have computers they didn't in the past. How has technology influenced the efficiency or the manner in which you can educate? 30 years ago when I started, I would stand in front of a class. I could write on the chalkboard. I could give them books to read. Now I can project pictures that I've chosen that really illustrate what I'm saying. I can project interviews that are done with survivors so that students can meet survivors, at least see them. That's so important now that survivors themselves are dying out and we won't be, students won't be able to meet survivors anymore except to look at them. Uh, students can watch programs like the Shalom Show and they can learn that way. They can see them on their computers. They can see them on a TV screen. They can see them in the classroom. It makes an enormous difference. These, this generation of students is very visual. Standing in front of a group and just lecturing at them is not enough. So the ability of technology to show them images in my subject, which is an unimaginable, how can you imagine what the Holocaust is? You have to see it. That makes an enormous difference in my ability to get ideas across to my students. Well, I certainly fully agree with you and uh, believe that multimedia and technology can be used to enhance education and uh, make the world a better place uh, by bringing people to a higher standard of lucidity and uh, step away from fundamentalism, irrationalism, and all the obscure other things people so uh, easily embrace in this world. People need to be in touch with reality and learn from the past. So uh, before we end, please share with our audience your plans for the future, sir. I've gotten involved in this story about Shanghai. I've written a couple of books about it. I'm not finished yet. 
Uh, I would like to do more research and learn more about it. And I would like to do that in collaboration with some Chinese scholars. Uh, I've said that I've gotten to know some of these Chinese scholars, and now I've just begun this year to begin to work with some of these scholars who come from the Shanghai Jewish Refugees Museum, very interesting museum, the only museum in Shanghai which is about people who are not Chinese. It's about these refugees. And I've begun to work with some of those scholars I can imagine some intercontinental collaboration with them, doing more research. I would like to go to China more. I would like to bring them here. And so I see that in my future. What you're doing is so very important, and I wish you a lot of success with it. In fact, I'd like to collaborate with you and see how we might do some things together in the future. A real great pleasure. Thank you so very much for being with us. I look forward to that, Richard, very much. Thank you. Thank you. I'll be right back. This brings us to the end of our special show for today. I'm Maya Peretz. Thank you so much for being with us. Mm -hmm.